Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church. My name is Lindsay Milbreath, one of the elders here. Uh, Pastor Foote is in the balcony. He will be down in a bit. Uh, so welcome as we continue our Lenten journey in this first Sunday in Lent. And we begin with our opening hymn, hymn number 423, Jesus, Refuge of the Weary. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are free. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of the altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seek his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for me and for his sake. He forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 25 is today's psalm. We read it responsively. It's in your bulletin on pages 3 and 4. 
To you, Lord, I lift up my soul. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my wrongdoings. Remember me according to your faithfulness, for your goodness' sake, Lord. He leads the humble in justice and teaches the humble his way. Lord be with you. The collect for today is in the middle of page four in your bulletin. We go to our Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, as we watch your faithful journey after baptism, we see in you our ultimate success and deliverance. We pray that we would be inspired by your holy word to never desire to sin or walk down the path of temptation by our own design or weakness. Bless us as we grow as the stewards of all that is yours, including our body and soul and all things. May we be willing to make good and godly sacrifices guided by your word. May the voice of your promise to forgive the faithful and to raise the dead give us the courage to walk faithfully confident and joyfully in this veil of tears. In your name we pray. Amen. Maybe see The Old Testament reading is from Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 through 18. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I, here am I. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, 
your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, and I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offering shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from James chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the verse of the day in our gospel reading. Once again, in your bulletin on page 5 at the top, you'll see the verse for the day, Mark 1, 13. We read this verse together. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were serving him. The Holy Gospel for this first Sunday in Lent is recorded in Mark chapter 1, beginning at the ninth verse. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, o Christ. And we join with the Church Universal and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 5 in your bulletin. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation was found and was incarnate, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, 
and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. A sermon hymn is hymn 418, O Lord, throughout these 40 days. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God the Father, who first called to Abraham with the promise that in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And from Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, who would be the sacrifice of God that would ultimately provide for the world that we could hear and see by the eyes of faith the promises of God fulfilled in Christ our Lord. And from God the Holy Spirit, who sprinkles our heart clean with his holy word in the waters of baptism and calls us to walk by faith, not by sight, always remembering that he is our paraclete. He is by our side. So on this first Sunday in the Lenten season, we have two poignant stories, one from the Old Testament, Genesis 22, the binding of Isaac, and also the New Testament account of Jesus' baptism and temptation, which is always the reading for the first Sunday in Lent. And this year we have the account from Mark. Certainly those two different accounts are related. We will spend a little bit of time visiting the baptism of Christ, but most of our time will be spent in Genesis 22 in a difficult passage, which I think is probably best entitled The Offering of Isaac, because we remember that he really wasn't sacrificed, so calling it the sacrifice of Isaac is not entirely proper. He was offered, and there were two substitutes that were ultimately sacrificed, one penultimately in the ram that was tied up in the horns and the foliage, and the lamb that was Jesus Christ, that would be the permanent substitute for Isaac, for you, for me, and the world. 
If you're paying any attention to the bulletin, you may have seen that there is an atypical text given for today, one that is beyond our Old Testament reading. It's really difficult, almost impossible, to see properly what this difficult story is from Genesis 22 about going back and looking at the promises that were made to Abraham earlier. Otherwise, it looks like a story of a sort of an ogre god demanding things that he would later prohibit, child sacrifice and things like that. So we can't make sense of Genesis 22 unless we look at some of these passages, beginning with Genesis 17. Genesis 17 is the account, and I'll just distill it down to a few simple things, where Abraham is told to rename his wife Sarah, which means princess, because she is going to be in the princess position of being the mother of kings and nations and peoples, implying that she's going to have kids. At that account, you may recall that Abraham is the first one to laugh at the promise. He laughs in his heart. God doesn't say anything this time. Later on, Sarah would laugh, and then God would say something. The chapter ends with the circumcision of Abraham, which makes him probably one of the very few people who are 99 years old to have surgery. Uh, He and all of his household. And hence, we have this introduction to the promise, the covenant, which literally means cutting. It was a relational arrangement where a superior king would come to a vassal king and said, this is how we're going to have this relationship, and if anybody breaks the relationship, this is what's going to happen, and they would have a sacrifice. And the sacrifice would represent anyone who breaks that covenant promise. In Genesis 18, verse 14 only, it's the only verse I'm looking at, and here is the account where Sarah overhears the promise that she as a 90-year-old woman is going to have a baby and her husband is approaching 100, and she laughs in the tent, this time audibly apparently, and the angel of the Lord who is visiting Abraham responds to the laughter, no doubt reminding Abraham of his own laughter with these words, is anything too difficult for the Lord? At this appointed time next year, I will return to you, and Sarah will have a son. Then we get to Genesis 21. It's the promise fulfilled. It's the birthday party for Isaac. Isaac is born. He then is circumcised on the eighth day, probably one of the very few eight-day-old children to have surgery. And in this particular case, Sarah laughs again. But only because the promise is fulfilled and the joy in her heart is overflowing. And then she makes this statement. Who would have said that Sarah would bear to Abraham a child that she would nurse in their old age? And of course, you and I know the answer. God would have said that, and in fact, God did say that. And so the promise is finally fulfilled. Actually, between Genesis 12, when God first calls Abraham, and Genesis 22, when we have today's Old Testament account, there are at least 21 verses where God references either specifically or obliquely, tangentially, that Abraham is going to have descendants through Sarah. Two times he specifically said that Isaac would have descendants. So now God has made a lot of promises between chapter 12 and chapter 22. Many of them have been fulfilled, some have not. Almost all of those promises regard childbearing and Sarah and Abraham and in two cases, Isaac having his own children. When we get to the birth of Isaac, if you have been familiar with those previous chapters, you are aware that Abraham was not always the rock of faith that we see from Genesis 22 moving forward. 
we see a different Abraham after chapter 21. When this boy, Isaac, is born to a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman, Isaac now, Abraham now becomes the rock of faith that he was not previously. He was a vacillator. He was a guy who lied about his wife and his relationship so that he could protect himself. He was a guy who was a person who would listen to his wife's poor substitute plan about having kids through her maid than God's preferred plan of waiting until the proper time to have a child through Sarah. He was a God who goes along with the plan because he is not patient. He wants God to do it now. He's been waiting, goodness, for years and years because of that promise he made early on in Genesis chapter 12 that he would have a nation following him. But now in chapter 22 and moving forward, we see a man who is totally different, a man who is courageous, a man who is faithful, a man who, of course, is sacrificial. He's willing to take this child that he has waited for for his whole life, really, uh, his whole adult life, his whole married life, and especially the last 25 years that he had that promise that it would be through him that the world would be blessed. The child has arrived. A quarter of a century of promises have been fulfilled. And now God says, okay, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and sacrifice him on a land that I will show you. Like Abraham, when we get to the virgin birth of Jesus, and maybe when we fast forward a little bit and get to the forever faithful Jesus who is loving, trusting, giving, sacrificial, or maybe if we go a little bit further and we look at Jesus praying for those who are crucifying him, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Or maybe if we get a little bit further on three days later and see the resurrected Lord. You see, we have those same promises fulfilled that Abraham got to see. Now when we see Christ through all those promises fulfilled, it should change the way we think about living and forgiving and loving and making sacrifices. So that our life now reflects Abraham's life in Genesis 22. So let's take a moment and visit this particular tremendous test of Abraham. And it really starts with the resurrection. I like to call it Abraham's early morning faithfulness. And you notice that when that day comes, Abraham doesn't hesitate. He gets up early in the morning and heads off for the land that God will show him. Just like the first time he was called. So when we think about the resurrection, I don't know that Abraham knew that Christ one day would come, be sacrificed, and be raised up. He may have known that. God may have given him that as a prophet. God told him things that are not always included in the text. But he certainly believed that this boy, this boy who was just probably 12 years old, this boy was going to be the one that would live if God took his life. Those two promises specifically about Isaac having children were in the back of his mind. So after God made this incredible, difficult order, Abraham was thinking about the birth of this child. God has always fulfilled his promises to me. This boy was born when I said it couldn't be done. And this boy... God promised would have children. There's got to be a future I do not see. There's got to be a resurrection. And in fact, when we see Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, talk about all these faithful people in the Old Testament, 
he gives three verses about this particular account, and you may know them from Hebrews chapter 11. By the way, a great faith chapter. If you're looking for a chapter to read, if your faith is weak, go to Hebrews 11. And this is what the author says. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. His last words, he considered that God is able to raise even many from the dead. Abraham believed that Isaac would be resurrected, and that's why he followed through one reason. I call that resurrection resolve. When you know and believe firmly that the resurrection is coming, you start to act differently. When you really believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, you start to act differently. You start to live with one foot in heaven. You start leaning more and more on that resurrected nature that we get in the waters of baptism. And as we turn to our epistle lesson for just a short visit with Jesus' half-brother James, you may remember that James was an unbeliever. Thought his brother was whacked. Must not have followed him carefully enough to listen to all his words and see what he had done. And it really wasn't until the resurrection of Jesus that James changed. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, Paul writes, God made a specific appearance to his brother James. God doesn't usually do that. He did the same thing to Paul. God does not reward unbelief. And yet that's what he did with James. And so James now writes in the first verse of our epistle reading today sort of a resurrection resolve. This is what he said. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So James realizes that the resurrection really does change everything. That when you're under trial, you remember that Jesus was raised from the dead. And one day, all those who believe in Christ as Savior will be raised from the dead. And what about Jesus? What about James' half-brother, Jesus? The last words of our gospel reading. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the, what's the word? Repent and believe the gospel. What's the word mean? Good news. What's the good news in the gospel? Well, we're forgiven and we're going to heaven. We're going to be raised from the dead. The gospel is the last word. It's the good news. And it is why we can stand against Satan and his minions and a distorted world that turns truth inside out and calls, as the prophet said, false said true and what is true false. When you and I face temptation, we do it with the resurrected Christ living in our hearts and his word in our ears and in our heads. And we do it as though we do have one foot in heaven. Because we do. That's what it means to be baptized into Christ. To have the living Lord present, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in us, directing our soul and spirit. It is to remember that we are forgiven. And the many times we have not stood strong in temptation, God still stands by our side. What does he ask of us? The same thing he does in our gospel. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Believe the gospel. The last word is the gospel. God doesn't leave us when we fail. When we face temptation, we are looking at the eyes of temptation with victory. Jesus won every single battle against temptation, and we get that record undefeated now and forever. So what we really have in Genesis 22 is not so much a story about Abraham's faithfulness. We have a story of God's faithfulness to Abraham 
which changes the way that he looks at his own temptations and trials. Remember the psalm that you spoke earlier. Remember, Lord, your compassion and your faithfulness, for they have been from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my wrongdoing. Remember me according to your faithfulness, another verse says, for your goodness sakes. All those who love the Lord remember his faithfulness and truth is another verse from Psalm 25. Genesis 22 is about Abraham going back to the word of God and saying, you have always been faithful to me. In my failures, when I try to pass off my wife as my sister, you stood by me. Abraham remembers the good news, the gospel, the forgiveness of sins, and the future life everlasting. But really, Genesis 22 is about God's faithfulness in Christ. You know, there's all these pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament, and he himself would say in the Gospel of John, these testify about me. He's talking about the Old Testament. This one is like the picture of Jesus. Why? Because God says to go to the land of Moriah. The word Moriah means the Lord sees. Go to where the Lord sees what's going to happen. The land of Moriah, according to the books of Chronicles, is the city of Jebus. Jebus that was conquered by David and renamed Jerusalem. The land of Moriah was a land that included three hills. I kind of like to think God is Trinitarian in his geography, too. And the middle hill is where it all happened. And on that hill, the same hill that the plague of death was stopped during David's day, God would put his son on a cross. His son, his only son, whom he loved in place of us. And the plague of death would stop there forever. Because in a garden tomb not far away from the cross, Jesus would break out and show us life after death. And so when they're going to this, we start to hear the voice of Abraham as he addresses his two servants. And he says, you stay here with the donkey. We will go and worship and return to you. He's thinking resurrection the whole time. We are going, we are coming back. Even if God has to raise my son, who he promised would have kids from the dead. And when the son asks the question about the sacrifice, what does he say? God will provide for himself a lamb for sacrifice. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has given us picture after picture after picture that Jesus has made a promise to us based upon an Old Testament promise already fulfilled, already given a picture of himself, of God, fulfilling yet more promises. And so when we face temptation, we face it with the courage of God's faithfulness to us. He has always kept his word. He has shown us in Jesus what he is really going to do. And Genesis 22 is about the clearest picture without literally Calvary happening in the Old Testament that God could say, that's what I'm going to do for you on that mountain with my son. Repent and believe the gospel. And I don't know if you picked up this really important nuance, but when Abraham raises the knife, and really the Hebrew word is not knife, it's cleaver. And it's not a sacrifice. The word that's used there is slaughter. What the author is telling us, this is slaughter. Don't do this. And he doesn't. God stops it. But what does the angel say 
out loud from heaven. Abraham! Abraham! From heaven. So Isaac would hear. My dad is not crazy. God's word spreads to other people when we speak the gospel. Jesus is the one who was speaking those words. He is the angel of the Lord. It's the angel of the Lord who would make that sacrifice. God calls his people to make small sacrifices, and he's transparent about it. He says, take up your cross and follow me. We do it because it, we know it doesn't end with the cross. It ends with the gospel. That's the last and loudest word. Good news. Resurrection. Forgiveness. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond what we understand, keep our hearts and minds strong in Christ so that we might serve him with resurrected resolve always. Amen. And we rise and we sing the offertory hymn. The offertory hymn is, O Christ, You Walk the Road, 424. gather your offerings and your prayers. There's an orange card in front of you. If you have a prayer request for the service, fill it out and give it to the children. If it's a private prayer request, fill out the back of the card and drop it in the box as you leave today. You may be seated.
Jesus Christ, what more can you do to convince us of your love? We thank you for this beautiful foreshadowing of what you would do yourself in offering yourself on the cross in our place. We thank you, Lord, that Abraham was faithful. We thank you that he believed in the resurrection. And we pray that as we listen to your word and meditate upon it, that we too might believe in the resurrection and live the resurrected life, saying no to temptation and saying yes to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the Bryant family has a prayer request. Uh, Josh is scheduled for surgery on his leg this Wednesday. I've lost track of how many surgeries it's been, but it's been a lot. Um, and then prayers that uh, there would be complete healing uh, after this surgery. Um, another prayer, God's leading for how we at Trinity can share the good news and nourish the faith of our community. Um, a prayer request for Kevin Dunn who has either ALS or MMN, we don't know, but he is completely bedfast in Rochester and has been for months. And you know the test that that has to be every day. Also pray for two of our other members, Richard Ruckteschel, who has COVID for the fourth time, and, um, and also Davey Thurston, who is recovering well from his lung surgery. He's now out of ICU um, and doing much better in every regard, uh, still in the hospital. So we rise for these prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would be with this church, that we would have the confidence of Christ and resurrection resolve as we share Jesus in any way that we can, reminding people of the many, many times that you followed through with the promise made, ultimately, in Christ dying in our place and rising again to give us living hope every day. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who suffer physical burdens. We pray for Josh Bryant, who will be having another surgery on his leg. We ask, Lord, that this surgery would uh, bring him final healing after this traumatic injury. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who care for him on Wednesday and that uh, his recovery would be steady and quick and bring him confidence and strength. We pray, Lord, for Kevin Dunn, who day by day uh, sits in his bed unable to move. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill him with strength and courage and love. We thank you for his faith. We know it's been tested. We pray, Lord, that you would be with his family also who carries this burden with him. We pray for Richard Ruckdeschel, who has had numerous episodes of COVID. We ask, Lord, that you would encourage him, and this would not be yet an overwhelming test for him. You have promised not to test him beyond what he is able. May he believe your promises. Bring him healing according to your love. We are also thankful, Lord, that Davy Thurston has come through a, a long ordeal in the hospital and looks like he is on the final mend. Um, we pray for his ongoing healing. Uh, and if therapy is necessary, a, a proper therapeutic environment for him to continue his strengthening and recovery. May he remember your presence and abiding by his side at this time. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We prepare to receive Holy Communion. We follow the liturgy beginning with the preface on page 5 in your bulletin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation, above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, 
giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns through all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again tonight to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption that you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A couple of announcements I have about the schedule. Um, this week on Tuesday night and every Tuesday night up through Easter and beyond, we have uh, a class that prepares people to receive communion on a regular basis. And anybody who would like to receive communion on a regular basis should go to the class. It's also on Zoom, so uh, just check that out and you can call me if you need the web link. Um, also, Wednesday is a unique Wednesday night in Lent. We have an earlier service and an earlier dinner than normal. Uh, 5.45, the dinner begins. It goes until 6.30 when the worship begins. So it's a half an hour earlier worship than normal, and our dinner will be at 5.45. Uh, and again, people are invited to bring food even this week uh, when we welcome our after-school kids who have a special part in the service Wednesday night. Other announcements? Yes, Bob? The big meeting at the church today. Okay, thank you. Stephanie. The Yes group is finally resuming. Um, I had to take a little break, blame Noah. Um, but uh, if you need to know what that is or anything, if you're in a group, please talk to me or Kate. Um, we are going bowling next Sunday after church. And there's an announcement, the bowl turner. Darcy Bedore. Looking forward to those meals. Yes, Lisa Cooper. Yes, we have our uh, Lutheran Student Fellowship Bible study that meets on campus at Lewis Grace Hall in room 411 on Monday night. Hush monkeys. Wonderful. <laughs> Chairman Lindsay Milbert. Health meeting tonight, 7 o'clock. <laughs> Football season is over, so we're looking for something to do. <laughs> All right, great. Wonderful to see you today, uh, and uh, be safe out there uh, as you walk on the uh, sometimes slippery parking lot. Um, let us go with the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you and give you his peace. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus.